hardest kept was partly from the UK government through a growth deal and our commitment to the railways in that Secretary of State. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Direct train services between South Wales and Devon are a key part of our rail infrastructure, yet are mostly operated by older, less reliable rolling stock. But what do you see the prospects being to getting new, more modern trains operating these routes? Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to be able to tell you that more modern uh, stock is currently being rolled out on those particular routes. So the honourable gentleman will be able to benefit from more comfortable uh, carriages, which are also going to emit less carbon and therefore be better for the environment. Jerome, you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Roads are a devolved matter, and the decision to close the Menno suspension bridge was therefore made by the Welsh Government. Work has commenced on the emergency replacement of brittle hangars dating back to 1938, and this will be followed by additional maintenance works. Welsh Government ministers assure me that, subject to safety assessments, the bridge is due to reopen at the end of this month. Jerome Mayo. Mr. Speaker, the Medi Bridge supplies the lifeblood of tourism to Anglesey and the wider region. Given Welsh Labour's negligent handling of the maintenance of this bridge and now its closure for months, how does the Honourable Friend think Welsh Labour is doing on their manifesto commitment to rebuild tourism in Wales? Well, I thank my Honourable Friend for that question. Quality road infrastructure is vital to unlocking the potential of the North Wales visitor economy. I believe there are questions to be answered about specification of the contracted PFI maintenance schedule for the bridge, awarded by the last Labour UK government in 1998, and about the stalled consideration of a third crossing of the Menai Strait. I urge the Welsh Government to publish the findings of the Roads Review and resume the improvement of the North Wales Road Network. Michael Fabrican. Question 9, sir. Mr Speaker, um, I have regular discussions with the Welsh Government on increasing investment in Wales and supporting the Welsh economy. Our plans to release one Welsh freeport alongside our investment in infrastructure will act as a catalyst for further investment from the UK and beyond. Well, I'm grateful to my right honourable friend for his answer. During Covid, a number of nationalists, not all but some, used that opportunity in the closure of the Welsh border to incite anti-English feeling. And now we hear that Plaid Cymru, working with Labour, are going to introduce a hotel and other tax. What does he think that does for English investment into Wales? Well, Mr Speaker, I want to see people visiting Wales from England and from all over the world, and I'm sure that all those who do so will, will appreciate the, uh, the natural beauty and all that Wales has to offer to the tourism industry. So I was disappointed that there were some people who appeared to be indulging in anti-English rhetoric during the COVID crisis. I hope all members of this House, all members of this House, I think, would condemn the, that sort of behaviour. Uh, and I, I would simply say I want to do more to encourage tourism, and that's why I regret the fact that the Welsh Labour Government are bringing in a tourism tax. A tax on tourism is an attack on the tourist industry. The Governor. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Lots of investment between England and Wales. Progress on speeding up the Wrexham to Bidston line is about as slow as the trains on the Wrexham to Bidston So, I ask the second person has to. Mr. Speaker, I, I, I'm sure I speak for the whole government in saying that we are completely committed to better rail connections across the United Kingdom. I'm well aware of the, uh, the, the line between Wrexham and, and Bidston. I'm also aware that that went through a, a, a business case procedure. Uh, I'm not completely positive about it, but I can assure the Honourable Lady there are a number of projects in the RNET uh, proposals which will be discussed shortly by the Department for Transport. That completes Welsh questions. Before we come to the Prime Minister's questions, I would like to point out the British Sign Language Interpretation of Proceedings is available to watch on Parliament Live TV. We start with questions to Prime Minister Kate Knighton. Yeah. Question number one, please, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I know members from across the House will be as shocked and appalled as I am about the case of David Carrick. The abuse of power is truly sickening and our thoughts are with his victims. 
The police must address the failings in this case to restore public confidence and ensure the safety of women and girls. There will be no place to hide for those who use their position to intimidate those women and girls or those who have failed to act to reprimand and remove those people unfit from office. Mr. Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this house, I shall have further for such meeting later today. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the project champion for the North Midlands Manufacturing Corridor, next week I'm bringing together businesses, leaders and local councillors from across the region in Parliament to set out to Department for Trade the important 50 A500. The Minister understands the importance of investing in our infrastructure and unlocking the potential of our towns and cities. So will he urge government colleagues from Bayes and Dealer to attend the meeting and take a more important region? The final decisions on this scheme will be in the third road investment. strategy which is fully published next year but I know my honourable friend will be contacting ministers in the relevant departments to invite them to hear her case. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition. Yes sir. Yes. Thank you Mr Speaker. Can I join with the Prime Minister in his comments about the dreadful case of Carrick? Mr Speaker, it's three minutes past twelve. If somebody phones <laughs> If somebody phones 999 now because they have chest pains and fear it might be a heart attack, when would the Prime Minister expect an ambulance to arrive? Yeah. Oh. Mi Mi Mr Speaker, it's absolutely right that people can rely on the emergency services when they need them. And that's why we are rapidly implementing measures to improve the delivery of ambulance times and indeed urgent and emergency care. But I'd say to the honourable gentleman, if he cares about ensuring that patients get access to life-saving emergency care when they need it, why won't he support our minimum safety legislation? Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister could deflect all he likes, but for the person, for the person suffering from chest pains, the clock is ticking straight away. Every minute counts. That's why the government says an ambulance should be there in 18 minutes. In that case, it would mean just about 20 past 12. Now, I, don't, I know he doesn't want to answer the question I asked him, so I'm going to ask him again. When will that ambulance arrive? Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, because of the extra funding we're putting in to relieve pressure in urgent and emergency care departments, because of the investment we're putting in in ambulance call handling, we will improve ambulance as we are recovering from and indeed the winter. I say we should begin because he makes my case for me. He describes the life-saving care that people desperately need. So what? When in other countries like France, Spain, Italy, and others, why is he depriving people here that care? Mr. Speaker, he obviously doesn't know or doesn't care. I'll tell him. If our heart attack victim had called for an ambulance in Peterborough at 12.03, it wouldn't arrive until 10 past 2. These are our constituents waiting for ambulances I'm talking about. If it was Northampton, it wouldn't arrive until 12. Oh, oh. Order, order, order. Mr. Blister, I hope you want to see the rest of the questions out, because I want you to be here, but you're going to have to behave better. Uh, come on, yes, Dharma. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, I'm talking about our constituents. If they were in Northampton, it wouldn't arrive until 20 past two. If they were in Plymouth, it wouldn't arrive until 20 to three. That's why someone who fears a heart attack waiting more than two and a half hours for an ambulance. Not the worst case scenario, just the average way. Yep. So for one week, will he stop blaming others, take some responsibility, and just admit under his watch the NHS is in crisis, isn't it? Mr Speaker, I noticed the one place the honourable gentleman didn't mention was Wales. 
where we know ambulance time are even and the reason, the reason that is the case, because this is not about politics. This is about the fact that the NHS in Scotland, in Wales, in England, is dealing with unprecedented challenges, recovering from COVID, dealing with a very virulent and early flu season, and everyone is doing their best to bring those wait times down. But again, I'll ask him if he believes so much in improving ambulance wait times, why don't you support our minimum safety legislation? Mr Speaker, he won't answer any questions and take any responsibility. By one o'clock, our heart attack victim is in a bad way. Sweaty, dizzy, chest tightening. This is a heart attack and they're shouting, this is your constituent. Through emergency care is faster than it ever has been. We're discharging people at a record rate out of hospitals to ease the constraints that they are facing. And we are reducing the call-out rates by moving people out of ambulance stacks and being dealt with in a community. Now, these are all very practical steps that will make a difference in the short term. But I ask him again and again, and we know why. The reason that he is not putting patients first when it comes to ambulance waiting times is because he is simply in the pockets of his union paymaster. Mr. Speaker. This is real life. from Plymouth was killing cancer. Collapsed nine nine nine. Desperate help. She lived miles from the hospital, but they couldn't prioritise her. She was twenty six, and she died waiting for that ambulance. A young woman whose life was ended far too soon. And as a dad, I can't even fathom that pain. So on behalf of Stephanie and her family, would you stop the excuses, stop shifting the blame, stop the political games, and simply tell us when will he sort out these delays and get back to the 18-minute wait? Yeah. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, of course Stephanie's case is a tragedy. Yeah. Of course people are working as hard as they can to ensure people get the care they need. But he talked about political games. He is a living, ex living example of playing political games when it comes to people's health care. I've already mentioned what's been going on in Wales. Is he confident in the Labour-run Wales NHS? Nobody is suffering right now. They are, Mr Speaker, because the NHS everywhere is under pressure. What we should be doing is supporting those doctors and nurses to make the changes that we are doing to bring the care to those people. But I'll ask him this. If he is so, so concerned, so concerned about making sure that the Stephanies of the future get the cares they need, why? Why is he denying those families the guarantee of emergency life-saving care? So that's his answer to Stephanie's family. Deflect, blame others, never take responsibility. Just like last week, he won't say when he's going to deliver the basic minimum service level fee. Mr. Speaker, over the 40 minutes or so that these sessions tend to last, 700 people will call an ambulance. Two will be reporting a heart attack. Four will be reporting a stroke. But instead of the rapid help they need, many will wait and wait and wait. So if he won't answer any questions, will he at least apologise for the lethal chaos under his watch? Yeah. M M M Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, he, uh, he asked about the minimum safety levels. We, we will deliver them as soon as we can pass them. Why won't he vote for them first? Of all? But, Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we are, we are delivering on the people's priorities. As we've seen 
this week, the Honourable will just say anything if the politics suits him. It's as simple as that. He will break promises left, right and centre. He promised to nationalise public services. He promised to have a second referendum. He promised to defend the mass migration of the EU. And now we're apparently led to believe that he... Oh, oh. I expect the front bench just to keep a little quiet. Because if they don't, there's somewhere else for them to shout their nose. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, if we are going to deliver for the British people, people need to have strong convictions. But when it comes to the honourable gentleman, he isn't just for the free movement of people, he's also got the free movement of principles. Mr. Speaker, on Monday, the independent zero review by my friend, the member of Kingswood. Does my right honourable friend join me in welcoming many of those recommendations, and in particular, to provide clarity and continuity to all those working to modernise the economy, especially those uh, supporting South Shropshire Climate Action Group in my constituency? Yeah. 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 Well, Mr. Speaker, I thank my right honourable friend for his but also pay tribute to my honourable friend for his work in this area. Uh, I'm pleased that the report recognised the UK's leadership in tackling and catalyzing a global transformation in how other countries are dealing with it. Uh, we have, as the report acknowledged, exceeded expectations to decarbonise, and we're responding to the full range of uh, the review's requests and recommendations in the coming year. Leader of the SNP, Stephen Flynn. Yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, to promise is a thing, to keep it is another. Well, the Scottish Government kept their manifesto promise to the people, and thanks to support from members of all political parties in Holyrood, the GRR Bill was passed. Surely in that context, the Prime Minister must recognise that it is a dangerous moment for devolution when both he and the leader of the opposition seek to overturn a promise made between Scotland's politicians and Scotland's people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, let me be crystal clear that the decision in this case is centred on the legislation's consequences for reserved matters. As it's laid out in the Scotland Act, which established the Scottish Parliament, which the Honourable Gentleman talks about, and at the time supported by the SNP, this bill would have a significant adverse effect on UK-wide equalities matters, and so the Scottish Secretary, with regret, has rightly acted. So, Speaker, let me be crystal clear. This is the Conservative Party seeking to stoke a culture war against some of the most marginalised people in society, and Scotland's democracy is simply collateral damage. And on that issue of democracy, let's reflect. Because on Monday, the UK government introduced legislation on the right to strike against the express wishes of the Scottish government. On Tuesday, they introduced legislation to overturn the GRR, the express wishes of the Scottish government. And this evening, they will seek to put in place legislation that rips up thousands of EU protections against of the Scottish government. Are we not now on a slippery slope from devolution to direct rule? Yep. Yeah. Yes. No, 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 Mr. S no, Mr. Speaker, of course we're not. This is simply about protecting UK-wide legislation, about ensuring the safety of women and children. This is not about the devolution settlement. I would urge the Honourable Gentleman and his party to consider engaging on the as we did before the legislation passed, so that we can find a constructive way forward in the interests of the people of Scotland and the United Kingdom. Edward Timpson. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The care, education and support that children receive in their earliest years has the biggest impact on their future life outcomes. And that's why the affordability, accessibility and quality of childcare is so important for families in Edisbury and right across the country. Yet, despite significant investment by the UK government since 2010. For too many families, the childcare system remains inflexible, complex and expensive. So can I ask my right honourable friend to restate to this House his commitment to address 
this essential and pressing issue so that every child can have the best start in life. Yeah. Well, I know this is a, a topic my honourable friend knows very well from his uh, own background, and he's right that it is essential to access quality childcare, which is why we provide every three and four year old eligible with at least 15 hours a week of free childcare. And we are considering new plans to improve the cost, choice, and affordability of childcare, whether consulting on ratios or indeed supporting more people to become childminders. Andy. The Transport Secretary implying NHS workers are deliberately putting people in danger. A Health Secretary pitting dedicated nurses against vulnerable patients. Does the Prime Minister really expect the public to believe that the very people who have dedicated their lives to saving life and limb are so reckless? Or is it not the case that this government have pushed them to their absolute limit and they have no other option but to strike? Uh, Mr Speaker, we have enormous respect and gratitude for all our public sector workers, especially those uh, in the NHS, which is why we have backed them with not just record funding, but also record investment in more doctors and nurses, 15,000 more doctors, 30,000 more nurses, and more life-saving equipment, which will help them do their jobs, and we continue to want to engage constructively in dialogue with them. David Simmons. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Right at Northern and Pitta has a great many car dependent, uh, older and disabled constituents, many of whom are horrified to read that the Mayor of London may have manipulated the outcome of his own consultation. May have manipulated the outcome of his own consultation in order to impose an unwanted £12.50 daily charge every time they go to a medical appointment. So, does my right honourable friend agree with me? that any further rollout of the ULIS should be paused until these matters have been fully investigated. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, my, uh, my honourable friend has rightly put it out that transport in London is devolved to the left of London and is disappointing that the mayor, backed by the leader of the opposition, is choosing not to, listening, not to listen to the public, expanding the zone against the overwhelming views of residents and business uh, properly and Mr. Prime Minister his card this week by ramming through the sacking bill. Yeah. He has he has he has literally gone from clapping nurses to sacking them. His transport secretary has said that the bill is unworkable, and the education secretary has said that it is not it is not needed. I still want the bill. Yeah. Mr. Speaker showed their cards this week when it came to backing working people. What I'd say, what, what I'd say, what I'd say to the honourable gentleman, what I'd, what I'd say to the honourable gentleman, if he really cares about supporting patients, if he really cares about children getting the education they receive, if he really cares about working people being able to go about their lives free from disruption, he should join actually in legislation prevalent in many other countries, ensure minimum safety levels in our critical public services, and get off the picket lines himself. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Continuing a theme, uh, evidence is now very clear that the London Mayor's sham consultation yeah, yeah, yeah. has suppressed yeah, yeah. 5,000 negative responses from members and supporters of Fair Fuel UK, of which I am the APPG chairman. Now, what angers me is this is a tax against my residents in South Thanet. It's a tax against Kent residents. It's a tax against all of the home counties. This is true taxation without representation. And I, I, when my right honourable friend assure me, he will do all that he can to stop this because it is a tax that is a fill up against a failed mayor's budget and a failed mayor. Well, my, my honourable friend makes an excellent and powerful point. The Labour mayor is imposing this tax on a public which does not want to highlight that. Expanding this zone is not something that communities want, and I look forward to working with him to urge the mayor to properly consider and respond to all these views and stop this unfair tax. Wait, David. Mr Speaker, during a period of 12 months, two of my capitalist ones have lost their lives after being attacked by dangerous dogs. A 10-year-old boy and a senior citizen. Fatalities have also occurred in other parts of the country. It is clear that the Dangerous Dogs Act 
is woefully inadequate. Yeah. The government has commissioned studies. It has debated the subject at length, but it has done nothing. No. My question is, when will the government take action on the issue of dangerous dogs? Yeah. 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 Well, my, uh, my honor the honourable gentleman raises uh, a very important case, and I'm very sorry to hear about the specific families that he mentions, and we recognize that dog attacks can have horrific consequences, and I want to assure him that we take the issue incredibly seriously, and that's why we've established a working group between police, local authorities, and other key stakeholders to consider all aspects of tackling irresponsible dog ownership. That working group will make its recommendations later this year, and of course, the government will respond promptly. Karen Bradley. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, yeah. staff, uh, staff of Smallland's district count by the Conservatives has an excellent track record of delivering for my constituents whilst keeping council tax low. We have put a bid in to the levelling up fund, and I know that that money would make such an incredible difference to my constituents. So will you encourage the Department for Levelling Up to look favourably on us this week? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, my, uh, my vulnerable friend has been a stalwart champion for her community, and in particular, their levelling up fund bid, which I know will make a massive difference to her community. I wish her and her constituents every success when we announce the next successful round of bidders to that fund. So agree. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Many of my constituents in Chesham and Amersham are struggling to keep up with their energy bills this winter. When they do fall behind, too often families are punished by being switched over to prepayment meters, which are more expensive which does nothing to help the financial situation. Will the Prime Minister back our call to ban energy companies from forcibly installing prepayment meters and stop energy companies from switching smart meters over to prepayment meters remotely? Well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I want to assure the Honourable Lady that Ofgem actually has specific regulations in place regarding the use of prepayment meters and how energy companies should treat those that are struggling with their bills. But what I am pleased to say is that her constituents will receive around £900 at a minimum of support with their energy bills this winter as a result of the actions of this government. Will my right honourable friend join with me in paying tribute to the several thousand people at the Defence Equipment and Support at Abbeywood in my constituency who work tirelessly to ensure that the military equipment and supplies that we have pledged to the people of Ukraine are dispatched quickly and efficiently. Yeah. And does he agree with me that events in Ukraine are a reminder yet again of the need to invest more in our own sovereign defence manufacturing capability? Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I'm from paying tribute to his constituents at the MOD facility. The work they are doing is making a critical difference in the fight to combat Russian aggression in Ukraine. I know it's extremely appreciated both by the president of Ukraine and his people. And he's right also that it highlights the need for more investment, which is why we're putting £24 billion of investment into our armed forces, but also increasing the amount of kit that we manufacture here at home. Labour. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. It's almost a year to the day since the then business secretary, uh, in a visit to the British Rural site in my constituency, promised the company £100 million and proudly boasted to the national media that he couldn't think of a, a better project that better demonstrated levelling up. Yesterday, the company and our administration haven't received not a penny in financial support from the government. Would the Prime Minister agree with me that there's not a single project in the country that better demonstrates a government's lack of industrial strategy, failure of levelling up, and abandonment of the North East? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, first of all, let me say my thoughts are with the company's employees and families at the time. And we stand ready to support those impacted. Now, let me just... Let me just out to what exactly has happened. We did offer significant support to British Vault through the Automotive Transformation Fund, considerable amount, of but entirely reasonably, and it's not something that I expect the Labour Party to understand, that support was conditional on the company receiving private investment as well, which I think is a sensible protection for taxpayers. Unfortunately, that didn't materialise, but I think it's completely wrong 
completely wrong to take from that about the, what else is happening in the Northeast. Across the Northeast, there is new investment in the new Envision and Nissan plant, in electric vehicle manufacturing, a billion pound investment in the Northeast. Just look at what's happening in Teesside or on clean energy. This government is committed to the Northeast and it will deliver more jobs and opportunity under this Conservative administration. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister has long been a friend to business. As Chancellor, he listened to businesses in Stoke-on-Trent Central about yeah, their yeah. issues. Stoke-on-Trent has a wide range of manufacturing, fabrication and engineering excellence. Does he agree with me that growing these activities is a vital strand of our nations? And I invite him to revisit my constituency to meet with them. Yeah. Yeah. Why, uh, my uh, honourable friend is an excellent champion for her constituents and particularly her advanced manufacturing uh, businesses, which I've had the pleasure of visiting with her in the past. It's important that we support those businesses on energy prices, which we are doing through the announcement the Chancellor recently made, particularly with regard to generous support for energy intensive industries. And indeed, it can also apply for up to £315 million of capital grant funding to help them make the transition to net zero. On Butler. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, when I had breast cancer, I had phenomenal nurses. When I had to be rushed to the A&E, the ambulance crew looked after me. Unison GMB, they're on strike because no one's negotiating with them. Mr. Speaker, for the first time in the Royal College of Nursing History, yes. they have balloted and they are on strike today. I've spoken to the General Secretary of the RCN. She's adamant she wants to end the disputes. She just needs a meeting with the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister show leadership and meet with the RCN? Just a simple yes or no. Mr Speaker, at the turn of the year, the government wrote all open on this two-way dialogue with relevant and Secretary is seeing those meetings happening in a range of sectors, and I hope that we can find a constructive way through this. Um, because we approach Memorial Day, colleagues can sign the early day motion, they can sign the book of commitment, they can attend the various commem commemorative services. I have to report some very sad news to the House, that the well-known Holocaust survivor, Ziggy Schipper, died at the age of 93 in the early hours this morning. He... Went out, he was a survivor of Auschwitz, Birkenau, and Stotthaus, Stotthof, concentration camps. He spent his life in this country spreading his message of hope to young people. Well, my wonderful friend, uh, join with me in thanking Ziggy for his life, for his message, which is very vitally important as we hear today. Do not hate. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm very sorry to learn that Ziggy has passed away. My thoughts are, of course, with his family. I know he was a man with wonderful, wonderful energy and humanity, and I pay tribute to him for his work, and indeed all Holocaust survivors who have so bravely shared their testimonies. We must have never forget the Holocaust, and as my honourable friend rightly said, I know the whole House will join me and him in echoing Ziggy's message, which is poignant and apt, do not hate. Graham Stringer. Will the Prime Minister join his Conservative uh, predecessors in guaranteeing that the HS2 project uh, will use Manchester, or does he still believe uh, that investment should be taken for poorer areas in the north and given to the more affluent parts of Kent? Mm. <laughs> Mr Speaker, this government is, is investing record sums in uh, transport infrastructure across the country, but especially in the north and midlands with the £96 billion integrated rail plan which will improve journey times east west across the north and connectivity across the east midlands it's a record we're proud of and now we'll get on with delivering it speaker there's been a 40 percent increase in patients on roll with gps in biggleswade in the last 15 years but last week proposals for biggleswade health hub were not progressed despite support financial support from conservative controlled central bedfordshire council so can my right honorable friend Advise me, what is the status of our manifesto commitment to infrastructure first? And will he and his ministers work with me to bring together the various parts of the NHS to bring the Biggleswade Health Hub back on track? 
Well, I'd be very happy to organize a meeting for the Honourable Gentleman to discuss how to progress his project. He's right about the importance of primary care. There is more investment going in, but we want to make sure it works for his constituency, and I look forward to arranging a meeting with him with the relevant minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister is well aware of the injustice of prepayment meters, not briefly recently because he commented on it earlier in a question, because it's long-standing tariff and higher social charges. Why then? Has he allowed a situation where hundreds of thousands have been forced into that penury at a time when winter is upon us and prices are rocketing and where we face a situation of 8.4 million people facing fuel poverty in April? All he requires to do is to instruct through himself or the minister off gem to ensure that there's an equalisation of tariffs between debit and credit and also that his government takes steps to provide a fund for those who have seen debt arise because of his government's failures. Will he end that manifest injustice of the poor paying most? Yeah, yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, I think this proposal would also increase bills in millions of families, so I'm not sure it is the right approach, but what we are doing is providing specific support with all families energy bills this winter. There's further targeted support for those who are most vulnerable, which is absolutely the right thing to do. And as the Chancellor has already announced, we're consulting on what the best thing to do going forward, including options, as he mentioned, such as a social tariff as part of our wider reforms to the retail energy market. Laura Burris. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Every single country in the G7 requires some level of minimum service to be provided when strikes take place in essential public services, often with laws that actually go much further than that. Does my right honourable friend agree that the British people should be entitled to the same basic level of protection when strikes take place in these services? And does he think the former Labour Prime Minister Tony Blair had a point when he said last year the big defect at the birth of the Labour Party was its tie to organised labour? Well, well, Mr Speaker, Mr. My, my honourable friend put it very well, but she's right to make the point that what we're proposing is in line with the vast majority of other countries around the world. Indeed, many countries ban strikes in blue light services altogether. We are not doing that. We are joining countries across continental Europe and having minimum safety at laws, which I think reasonably the public would expect to have a level of emergency life-saving life -saving care in the event of strikes. I think that's a common sense, reasonable position to take, and we all know why the party opposite can't bring themselves to support it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This month, the right honourable member for Stratford upon Avon was forced to pay millions to HMRC to settle the tax dispute. Was the Prime Minister aware of the investigation when he appointed him to his cabinet and as chairman of the Conservative Party? Will the Prime Minister demand accountability from his cabinet members about their tax affairs? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, this, my uh, friend has already addressed this in full, and that's not all that I can add. Well, should come. Speaker. If I may, I would like to begin by putting on record this House's heartbreak at the tragic death this morning of our friend Dennis, the Minister of Interior Affairs in Ukraine, and his deputy, and all those who were killed in that tragic accident. Yeah. I'm sure this part <clears throat> of the House is united in our feeling on that. Turning to more local affairs, as many have pointed out, the government, I understand, is in the final furlongs of giving out its levelling up bids, and I must ask him to look kindly upon building the market of the Midlands and building a future Meditech hub in Rutland. So can he assure me that not just urban, but also rural areas will be levelled up? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, let me join with my honourable friend in, in paying tribute to the family of the Interior Minister in Ukraine. I know our thoughts uh, will be with him. Uh, at this difficult time. And also, I can confirm to her that this government believes levelling up should apply equally everywhere across our United Kingdom. Urban and rural communities up and down the country will get the benefit of having the investment that they deserve, making sure that we can spread opportunity and ensure everyone has that they all home. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. David Cameron said the Scottish Parliament is one of the most powerful devolved parliaments in the world. Yet the Prime Minister continues to block the Scottish Parliament's clear mandate to allow Scots to choose their own future. And on Monday, he sent his MPs through a lobby to deny Scotland's right strike, despite overwhelming Scottish Parliament. And on Tuesday, he sent his Secretary of State for Scotland to yeah. block an act the Scottish Parliament for by seven Tories. Does he still think that the ridiculous and holds any water whatsoever. Yeah. Well, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, 
I, there have been 347 acts passed by the Scottish Parliament, which is undeniably one of the most powerful devolved legislatures anywhere in the world. In this exceptional case, it's clear that the Act does have adverse consequences for UK-wide equalities legislation. So in those very exceptional circumstances, the Scottish Secretary has regretfully taken the decision to block passage of the legislation. But as I said previously, we want to engage in a dialogue with the Scottish Government to ensure that we can find a constructive way through. Arabelle, the British people rightly expect us to be able to control our borders, so I was very pleased that the Prime Minister made one of his five priorities, the need to stop the boats in the Channel. Yeah. Can he reassure me and my constituents in Newcastle under line that not only will we bolster the patrols on the French beaches, but we will make sure the people who do make that dangerous journey and arrive are removed? Yeah. Yeah. Well, this Mr. Speaker, my friend is right that this is a priority for all our constituents. Uh, he's right to highlight the new deal that we have with France, which, is, which increases funded patrols on French beaches by 40%. Uh, and as he said, we must go further to solve this problem once and for all. And that means introducing new legislation that makes it unequivocally clear that if you enter the UK illegally, you should not be able to stay here, but instead will be swiftly detained and removed. Imran Hussain, by the, uh, Mr. Last night, BBC revealed the government for the persecution of Muslims and other minorities we see in India. We're reporting that the massacre could not have taken place without a climate of impunity created by Modi and that he In the FCO's own word, the Foreign Office know of his involvement in Thank you.